So welcome back. In this part, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the properties of dimension. Okay. So the first one here is kind of telling us something about the relationship with linearly independent and, uh, and spanning sets. So let's quickly walk through what the theorem is stating. We're not going to prove this one, but we're going to prove the, uh, the other theorem that I'm going to mention in a minute. So let's say you have an n-dimensional vector space. And so it has to have some basis containing an element. So if you have a set of vectors in V and you have more than n vectors, so it doesn't matter where these vectors come from. Somebody says, hey, your vector space is n-dimensional. Here is more than n vectors. Then you can tell them that, that the set of vectors is linearly dependent. So once you have too many vectors, you're actually going to be forced to have some sort of linear relation among the vectors. And a kind of a similar sort of thing works in the opposite direction when we think about spanning sets. So if you take a set of vectors in V that has less than n vectors, then that set can't, then the set of vectors cannot span V. So the one nice takeaway here is if you know the dimension of your vector space, if you know the n, and if you have too many vectors, then they're linearly dependent. So if you're looking for linearly independent things, you have to first make sure you have n or less vectors. And the other statement is saying that if you're looking for a set of vectors that span V and you know the dimension, you have to make sure you have at least the number of elements, uh, the number of elements has to be equal to the dimension. So let me just do a quick example. Hopefully this will help. R2 is two dimensional. Okay, so because of this, any three vectors in R2 are linearly dependent. It doesn't matter how you pick these vectors. Uh, it's not spelled right, let me fix that. No matter how you pick these vectors, they're going to be some sort of linear relationship among those vectors. And also what we know is that for any vector V that you pick in R2, the span of V1 will not equal R2 because you do not have enough vectors. And this example is quite easy to kind of visualize what's going on because the span of a vector is a line. So a line clearly doesn't fill up all of your plane. So that's what's happening here kind of geometrically in the case of R2. Next we come to the basis theorem, which is a kind of a very useful result. And I'm gonna prove one part of it. So let's say we have a vector space and we're given its dimension and this time we're using P for its dimension. And what it's, the first part is saying is, hey, once you know you have a linearly independent set of P vectors, then it's automatically a basis for V. And the second statement is saying that if you have any set of P vectors that span V, it's a basis for V. So what, what is this theorem telling you? Well, remember that to check whether a set of vectors is a basis, you have to check whether it's linearly independent and that it spans the set. What the basis theorem is saying is, if somebody in fact gave you an extra piece of information, they told you the size of your vector space, the dimension, then you only have to check your set of vectors for one of those two properties. So namely, if you show that you have a linearly independent set of P vectors, for free, you're going to get that it's a spanning set at the same time. And similarly, if you have a set of P vectors that span V and P is the dimension, then it, you're also getting for free that those vectors are linearly independent. And so it's a basis for V. So I'm going to show you part one, why this is true. Okay, and here's the setup. You have a bunch of P vectors. So P is the dimension. And you're given p vectors that are linearly independent. And then the claim is that v is actually equal to the span of all of those vectors, okay? Because that's the one thing that we're missing from showing that it's a basis. And so how does the proof work? Well, you do it by contradiction. Suppose that the span 
of these vectors, so all the linear combination of these vectors, is strictly contained inside of V. Right? So the, this here means contained in V, but not equal. Right? So here's kind of like a picture. Hopefully the picture will help you understand what's going on. Okay, so let's say my vector space V is this blob right there. There's my vector space V. And if we're looking at the span of the vectors V1 through Vp. And this is saying that it doesn't fill up the whole space. So the span of those vectors is kind of giving you a, a space inside of it. And now because of that, what I can do is I can find some vector V over here. So this is a vector in V, but not in the span of those vectors, V1 through Vp. Okay, So we're taking some vector V here. And this is kind of more mathematically how you would write it. All right, so let me write so we'll take a vector v in the set v, but not in the span of v1 through vp. OK, so this notation here means this right over here. You're taking something that's in v, but not in this set. OK, well, then what do you get here? Well, then v1 up to vp, and your new vector, v must be linearly independent, right? And why is that? If they weren't, you will have some sort of relation to give you the zero vector, right? Because then we would have something like this, and I'll write it like this. C naught, the first vector, plus C1 times the, uh, the vector V that's outside, and then C1 times the first vector, up to Cp times the last vector, equaling to zero, with C0 equal to zero. So if these vectors weren't linear and independent, you could cook up some sort of linear equation like this, and hopefully I have enough room here. Oh, no, I'll have to move over to the next page. So this is the same as saying that the vector v, right? So you're just going to rearrange the equation and solve for the vector v is minus c1 over c0 times the vector v1. So this is my coefficient minus c2 over c0 times v2 all the way down to minus cn over c0 vn. And this means, right, this is a linear combination of V1 through Vn. So this is in the span. Oh, I'm using P. Fix that. That's a P. And make this clearer so you can see this. This is in the span of V1 through Vp. Okay, so now, look, we end up with kind of a contradiction here because we have, we pick V not to be in the span, right? And if these guys were linearly dependent, if they guys are linear dependent, then V would be in the span. So they better be linearly independent. And so what we have here is, so V has at least P plus one, linear vectors in a dimension v equals p vector space. OK, but the very first fact here that I have, it's actually right here, is if you have a d, uh, p dimensional vector space, any, um, oh, sorry, wrong statement here. Go a little further. If you have a, a p dimensional vector space, Okay, so we're having p here, and if we have more than p vectors, then they have to be linearly dependent. So we get a contradiction. Right? So 
uh, this con contradicting. The first theorem, right? So no such V exists. So no such V exists. And because of that, that means that V is actually equal to the span of V1 through Vp, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. Okay, I know this part of the lecture has been a little long, but let me just finish up with what is the big idea here, why the basis theorem is great. It's great because what it's saying is if you, if you know, let me rephrase that, if you know two of the three, and what are the three I'm talking about? Dimension, uh, linear spanning, and linear independent. You also get information, you also get info about the third. So if somebody gives you information about dimension and linear independence, you can get some information about spanning. If you know something about spanning and linear independence, you can get dimension and so on. So the, these three concepts are all kind of linked and the basis theorem here and the very first theorem that we have are kind of describing how you can get information about knowing some of the information about say the dimension, about linear independence or dimension in the span and so on. So we'll take a little break here, uh, uh, just to pause. And then when we come back, we'll talk about some additional facts and give some more examples.